Hey, 42 here. In 1883, living on the islands between Java and Sumatra wasn't the best idea. And to be honest, living anywhere within 100 miles of them wasn't a great idea either. Why? Because that's where the island of Krakatoa was. And little did everyone know. But Krakatoa was about to become the deadliest place on Earth. In May, a German warship told of enormous clouds of ash rising from the peak of Krakatoa. The captain had declared them to be six miles high. And during the months after, continued sightings of ash clouds were reported alongside flashing illuminated clouds and ominous thunderous noises. You'd be forgiven for thinking that Godzilla was on his way. The inhabitants of nearby islands soon gathered near the coasts and held festivals in the honor of this unbelievable natural spectacle. And they all innocently looked on at mighty Krakatoa and its awesome performance. But, what they didn't know was that this performance was actually a countdown. At 12.53 p.m. August 27th, the island of Krakatoa exploded with one of the most devastating shows of force the world has ever seen. Eruptions of ash reached 24 kilometers into the sky. Explosions could be heard nearly 2,800 miles away in Perth, Australia. The detonation itself had an explosive force of 200 megatons of TNT, 10 times more powerful than the Mount St. Helens eruption and the nuclear bomb that detonated over Hiroshima. This was one of history's Mother Nature's been hitting the gin again moments. People were almost immediately consumed and killed by boiling volcanic rock fragments and searing volcanic gases. But then something much more horrifying took the lives of thousands more. An enormous tsunami created by the force of the eruption swept a wall of water almost 120 feet high across the coastlines of western Java and Sumatra. That's an almost 12-story wall of crushing liquid death. A rare instance when a tsunami actually resembled how it's usually depicted in films. Entire islands and 165 coastal towns vanished beneath the wave, completely destroyed. A steamship was carried one mile inland, and all 28 crew members were killed. And another, turning in time to position itself to surmount the crest of the wave, looked back to see that the town they'd been anchored at had been erased from the face of the earth. Mother Nature had hit the reset button. There were 36,417 deaths in total, by far one of the deadliest and most destructive volcanic eruptions in history. Noise of the explosion even reached Rodriguez nearly 300 miles away. A wave of pressure shot from the volcano at 1,086 kilometers per hour, 90% of the speed of sound, rupturing the eardrums of sailors 40 miles away in the Sundra Strait. In fact, the wave was so powerful, it rounded the entire world three and a half times. When all was said and done, less than 30% of the original island remained. Adios. Hasta la vista, never coming back. The lesson here, there are some shockingly deadly places on Earth, and if you can help it, you really should avoid them. But look, I hear you saying, that's 1883. Where would it be wise to avoid today? And I understand, there's going to come a time when COVID finally pisses off, and we're all going to be released into the wild, excited to explore once more. But getting it wrong could cost you more than your plane ticket. It might cost you your life. Because there are some countries that have dangerous places or geological features, such as notorious prisons, sinkholes, or certain dangerous neighborhoods. But then, there are other countries so uniquely dangerous as a whole that your life is just flat out more likely to end by stepping foot within its borders. El Salvador, for instance, is one place on Earth that you are far more likely than anywhere else to be murdered by another human being. It has a murder rate of 61.8 per 100,000 people. To give you some context, the USA is roughly 4 per 100,000. That's over 15 times higher. With interpersonal violence being one of the leading causes of premature death. For some more context, in the UK, that role is filled by cancer. And murder is significantly lower on the list. Last year, there were only 650 homicides in total. 
El Salvador's homicide rate has actually fallen since the 90s, but there are still 2-3,000 to 3, each year. But there's more to this story, and it's actually much worse than the statistics suggest. You see, in El Salvador, you aren't just stabbed or shot. You'll either be found, brutally slaughtered, with like your legs sticking out of your mouth and your eyeballs jammed into your wallet, or you'll never be found at all. This is perhaps one of the more disturbing facets of El Salvador's violent reputation, because disappearances are not included in homicide statistics. After all, if no dead body is discovered, where is the homicide? But at the same time, disappearances are unsettlingly common, meaning the rate of murder is probably much, much higher than the one I just mentioned. In fact, an article from The Guardian cited 3,382 people reported missing that year at the time of the article's publication, November 2019. The Attorney General listed 2018's figure as 3,437, more than the number of homicides reported those two years. You know I said the homicide rate is dropping. Well, when you consider that the disappearance rate is simultaneously increasing, it suddenly raises a huge red flag. Most horrifying of all though, those disappearance numbers were widely seen as an undercount. But why the hell are all these people being killed, or disappearing, or most likely both? What is the cause? Well, in many ways, El Salvador is a country ruled by gangs. Of their 6.5 million population, 10% is seriously involved in the criminal underworld. Gangs like LA18, MS13 and Maras have a powerful influence on the country and its citizens, controlling 242 out of its 267 municipalities, and wildly outnumbering the police. On top of this, the gang members are hunted by the vigilante death squad, Sombra Negra, who slaughter any gang member they can get their hands on. The result is a country where death is rampant, with almost 11 killings every day. This is where the disappearances come in. When there is no body, there is no evidence meaning killers wanting to stay hidden, or police wishing to hide illegal executions, which happen, by the way, are motivated to hide their bodies. It's also probably part of the government strategy to reflect a safer El Salvador, and to do that, violence needed to become invisible. When the country's two top gangs formed a government-backed truce, the inter-gang violence and resulting homicide rate seemed to decrease, but the disappearances increased, leading many analysts to suggest that El Salvador isn't just a country most likely to see you murdered, it's also one where your body will probably be hidden to keep the murder rate down. Now, you might think, that's it, end of video, don't go there, I'm likely to get murdered, got it. Well, not quite, because there's another country where you're likely to get eaten alive, torn to pieces, injected with venom, or simply crushed to death by animals. You might think, with its snakes, stonefish, spiders, emus and dingoes, Australia would be the worst country on earth for animal-related slaughters. But you'd be wrong. There are only 241 animal-related deaths between 2000 and 2010. India blows that figure out of the water, it annihilates it. If Australia is the talented welterweight of animal violence, India is the heavyweight champion of the world. Between April 2014 and May 2017, over 1,100 people have been killed by animals. For perspective, that's around 8 months to hit what Australia managed in 10 years. In India, there are massive 5,000 kilogram Indian elephants that go on rampages, flip and crush cars, and turn people into human jam underneath their enormous feet, killing over 250 people during 2016 to 17. And that's just the start of it. India is also home to the spawn of Satan itself snakes, Indian cobras, Russell's vipers, saw scaled vipers, and crate are all varieties of death-dealing snakes you can come across in India. The saw-scaled viper kills 5,000 people every year. The common crate? 10,000. The Indian cobra? 
15,000. The Russell's Viper, 25,000 people every year. Total snake bike fatalities are close to 50,000 per year from 2.8 million snake bites, leading the WHO to refer to it as a neglected tropical disease and global health priority. If we do some maths on that, that's 7,671 bites and 136 deaths every day. Eat your heart out, El Salvador. Those gangs ought to start getting Indian snakes on their payroll with some elephants to back them up as muscle. The Russell's Viper, the most likely assailant to get to you, and whose name in Hindi means the lurker, produces one of the most excruciating bites in the known universe, causing internal bleeding, severe swelling, necrosis, bleeding gums and genitals, blistering, vomiting, numbness, and of course, death. If he or his venomous brothers and sisters don't get you, a big reticulated python can also wrap itself around you and squeeze the last gasped breaths of oxygen from your lungs before you're inevitably swallowed whole like John Voight in the film Anaconda. And if you figure, well, you'll just stay away from the fields, jungles, villages and cities and stick to the safe beaches, there's even a snake in the sea that can kill you. There's nowhere that's safe. Chrysopelli ornata can even fly, gliding through the air as it directs its murderous fangs towards your jugular. I've heard of some scary creatures in my time, but a goddamn flying snake takes some beating. But don't sweat, I'm sure the Taj Mahal is lovely. To top it off, there are spiders, leopards, sloth bears, and lastly, gigantic man-eating tigers. One of which, the Champawat tiger, killed over 435 people. Yes, that was one individual tiger. She makes Jeffrey Dahmer look like a children's entertainer. And during 2016 to 17, 27 individuals were stalked and killed by man-eaters. But in most countries, humans and the animal kingdom pose a limited threat to your existence. As the story of Krakatoa's eruption in 1883 demonstrates, the environment is the real danger. The pleasant Pacific islands look pretty good, right? picture-perfect beaches, crystal-clear waters, near-year-round perfect sunshine, and more fresh coconuts than you know what to do with. But in the case of Vanuatu, there's a fairly decent chance your holiday plans would be interrupted by almost certain death. Vanuatu is home to cyclones, tsunamis, earthquakes, and active volcanoes. They're just awaiting a meteor strike to complete the roster. Not only is Vanuatu home to such a staggering array of disasters, but it also, according to the UNUEHS, has a 36% risk of a natural disaster occurring every year. The most of any nation in the world. On top of this, 64% of Vanuatu citizens are exposed to natural disasters each year. One year, it was hit by an earthquake, then a volcanic eruption, then the largest cyclone to ever hit the South Pacific, one after the other, all in the very same year. And we complain about 2020. All of this means, if you go to Vanuatu, you've got a good chance you're going to get caught in the middle of a natural disaster that will pulverize you into oblivion. But there's another country that knocks Vanuatu out of its crystal clear water for total deaths from natural disasters, China. According to the UNUEHS metric, China only has an annual natural disaster risk of 6 to 7%. But it has something else going for it. Of the 10 deadliest natural disasters since 1900, excluding epidemics and famines, China holds five out of the 10 places, including first for the 1931 China floods, which were estimated to have killed as many as 4 million people, potentially as much as all the other disasters combined. So. If you spend a year in Vanuatu, a disaster is probably going to hit you. But in China, if it does, you're almost definitely going to die. Take your pick. So, there we have it. Those are the countries where you'll be murdered by other people, killed by animals, or obliterated by the weather. But there is one other method of death which I haven't mentioned so far, and it's perhaps the most insidious of all. And that's the country where you're most likely to be killed by the very thing that is intended to protect you, your own government. I know the US has gotten a lot of bad press recently, 
surrounding police violence, but there's another place where the issue actually is systemic, and it puts all that hysteria into perspective. That country is Venezuela. If we take one of the most basic metrics for measuring a government's level of violence towards its own people, the number of deaths caused by law enforcement officials, then Venezuela rocks in at a whopping rate of 1,830.2 per 10 million people. The worst on earth by a country mile. El Salvador, that old country of sunshine, rainbows, and gang warfare, swings into second place with 954.5 per 10 million. That's just scraping half. The USA? Just 46.6. Need I say any more? A UN report stated that the extrajudicial killings by security forces, in particular the special forces, had been alarmingly high. In 2018, there were over 5,200 killings in Venezuela marked as resistance to authority. And between January and May of 2019, more than 1,560 people were killed. But given these figures are the government's own, the true number may be much higher. The report also explains how 739 people had been randomly deprived of their freedom, and almost two dozen wielders of political immunity had watched as it was casually stripped from them without any mercy. In short, the government does whatever the hell it wants and has no problem killing you. A lot of this is down to the fact that Venezuela is batshit insane right now, and in many ways, the most deadly country on earth. Besides the fact that Venezuela is filled with deadly animals, has its own problems with criminal gangs, has the second highest murder rate worldwide, rates of kidnapping that increase year on year, and is dangerously close to a global hurricane hotspot, Venezuela is also a country that is struggling not to fall apart. The state continually violates its obligation to support access to food and healthcare, leaving large portions of the population starving, suffering from malnutrition and desperate. Hospitals are understaffed with little supplies, or even the electricity to keep it running. And between 2018 and 19, over 1,550 people died because of a lack of medicine and equipment. And politically, the country is a shambles. How did this occur? Well, to borrow the parlance of Reddit, the TLDR of the situation is hyperinflation, sending the price of everything way up, corrupt politicians, power cuts, starvation, and just about everything you could want to make a population and its oppressive government as desperate and dangerous as possible. The whole thing is basically an exercise in how to destroy a country 101. There have even been insane instances of political opposition leaders having to break into parliament to be sworn in, using entire mobs of their supporters to help them smash past the authoritarian guards. Yeah, I know, crazy. But hey, that's what socialism will do for you. So even though I sincerely wish them well, and wish the people good fortune and a brighter future, I have to say, with a vicious, oppressive, and ostensibly murderous government, little healthcare, little food, a staggering crime rate, dangerous rainforests, and swirling nearby storms, Venezuela is definitely the most dangerous place on Earth. So perhaps go to one of Earth's safest countries instead, but I'll save that one for another video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider supporting me. You can do that by joining the 42 Club here on YouTube, or you can head on over to Patreon. Links for both are in the description. Thank you. You can also get your hands on a first edition signed copy of my new book, Stick a Flag in It, by heading on over to Unbound Publishing and pre-ordering your copy today. The link's in the description. Thank you.